Welcome to iLecture Online. So for many decades we've been trying to peer into the center of our galaxy and throughout that band that of course is obscured by all those dust lanes and nebulas we've been trying to figure out what our galaxy looks like, what the structure of it is and what's on the other side and towards almost any direction we're really hampered by all those dust lanes and nebulas that get in our way from our visual for our visual telescopes. So here before us we have a picture of looking towards the center of our galaxy and again yes we can see some regions where some bright visual light is coming towards us but by and large the, the center galaxy is completely obscured by all those nebulas and dust lanes so how do we see through that and we already indicated in the previous videos that yes radio telescopes can peer through but there's only limited information we can get from it but then there's another thing we discovered and that goes back to the Pauli exclusion principle. He said that there's no way that any two electrons can occupy the same space, in other words, the same orbital, unless they have completely different quantum states. If they have the same quantum state, the same four quantum numbers, they cannot exist in the same location. And so the fourth quantum number is what we call the spin-flip quantum number because we realize that there are two places for two electrons in any orbital. So if two electrons can exist in that orbital, one of the quantum numbers must be different. And it's the fourth quantum number, what we call the spin-flip quantum number. Now the name is a little bit deceiving because electrons are point objects. So we can't really think of them as orbiting on their axis and flipping over. It's kind of what the name would imply, but it has kind of the same implication. There is two different quantum states that the electron can be in so they can exist in the same quantum location, in other words, in the same orbital. And if there's then only one electron in that orbital, well, that electron can either be what we call spin up or spin down. So I didn't write that down, so this would be called spin up, and this would be called the spin down condition. And it turns out that one of them is slightly higher energy than the other. In other words, if an electron changes from a higher spin-up condition to a lower spin-down condition in the same orbital, and it could do that, then when it, when it, when it uh, flips its spin, so to speak, it goes from a higher state to a lower state, it ejects a photon that has a wavelength of 21 centimeters. Spin-down. Hmm, thank you. Spin-down. That's what I wanted to write. Thank you. Yeah, spin down. So, when it transitions, that 21 centimeter photon is ejected, and we can detect that with radio telescopes. Because 21 centimeters is kind of between microwaves and radio waves. And so that is able to be detected via radio telescopes in those long 21 centimeter wavelengths, which are about 8 inches, 21 centimeters. They can make it through those nebulas and dust. So we can actually see that radiation coming towards us whenever those electrons do a spin flip. And so when they do that spin flip, we can recognize that, and then we can try to surmise what's on the other side, deep inside those dust lanes and nebulas. And that's how we try to figure out the structure of our galaxy. At least it's one of the ways in which we can do that. If you want to know how much energy that is, a photon that contains a wavelength of 21 centimeters, well, we do the energy of a photon is the, is the um, uh, Planck's, I'm drawing a blank. It is Planck's constant, isn't it? I think so. Look it up for a minute. Planck's constant. What number? I just want to confirm that's Nick called the Planck's constant. So if you want to know how much energy is contained within a photon like that, well, we can use the equation E equals H times F. That's the energy of the photon is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of that photon. And the frequency is equal to the speed of light divided by the wavelength. So we have Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength. That's 0.21 meters and now it pops 9.47 times 10 to the minus 25 joules. I always like to convert it to electron volts. That gives me a better idea. So divide by the conversion factor and we get about 6 times 10 to the minus 6 electron volts. That's not a lot because visible light has a energy of about 1.8 to about 3.2 electron volts. So this is way less than the photon of visible light. Not a lot of energy, but we can detect it with radio telescopes, and that's the key, because visible light doesn't make it to us from the vast regions of our galaxy. So you can see, you're basically blind. You're looking at a blob of clouds 
and you can't see through it. It's like driving through a fog and not knowing what's on the other side. It's exactly the same. And so by looking at the spin flip radiation from the hydrogen that's beyond the, with the visible range of our, our, our galaxy, well, we can figure out what it looks like in some extent based upon that radiation. And that is how it's done. So yeah, we're looking at the center of our galaxy right here. So this is kind of like towards the center. And this, this part right here kind of looks unique. And that's how you can tell you're looking at the center of the galaxy. So is that the, the whole thing of the bulge? Or so the bulge is, is about like right here. That's kind of like the bulge region right here. And then you have some of the dust lanes. So the galaxy goes way beyond this page. But it's kind of looking at the center. It's a blown up picture of it. I think that's a globular or cluster region, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So why is it red? Oh no. I mean oh why this is red? Mm -hmm. Oh. Why is that all that red? Well it turns out that one of the primary emission lines of nebulas that are lighted up by act by uh, bright stars that are within them or near them is the H alpha line of hydrogen, and that's the red line, and that's the most visible color that we see in all our nebulas. That's, why the, that's the reason why most of our nebulas do have that reddish color. Now, they may have also tried to combine this with infrared uh, coloration, so they might have also superimposed infrared on the visible to get a little bit more uh, structure of the clouds and the nebulas. So nothing to do with the older stars? No, no. The red is simply the nebulas and the light coming from the nebulas, which is primarily the H-alpha line, yeah, the red line from hydrogen. 